Okay, welcome back to part three. Here we're going to actually define uh, or at least show a way to calculate probability. So let me say in this very specific scenario where we actually sometimes we refer to this as classical probability, when all possible outcomes of a chance experiment are equally likely so every example we've done so far in these uh, in the previous two parts have satisfied this for example uh, flipping a coin flipping two coins uh, rolling a die um, if you think about it the sample space in rolling a die one two three four five six if it's a fair die hopefully each one of these outcomes is equally likely so that's what we're talking about here okay when we're assured or when we're pretty sure uh, um, intuitively that all the outcomes of a chance experiment are equally likely we can very easily or very kind of clearly I should say sometimes it's not so easy calculate the probability of a particular outcome or a particular event okay so first the notation we use capital P and in parentheses, we put the event. So let me use uh, an arbitrary uh, E for event E. So this is just the event E. I don't know what event E is right now. And when we do an example, we'll we'll have a uh, we'll we'll know what event we're talking about. This is read the probability of E. Okay. So the probability of E in this situation, when all possible outcomes are equally likely is equal to a fraction and it is a fraction which is a count in the numerator it's a, it's the number of outcomes favorable so let me just abbreviate that favorable to e so basically how many outcomes are in e over the total number of outcomes or number of outcomes in S, right? Okay, so I'm just trying to put this in words. It should be very intuitive, okay? So number of outcomes favorable to E, total number of outcomes in the sample space, okay? So let's do a little example. Okay, so let's do an example of this. So uh, we had, let's, we had the example uh, flipping, uh, sorry, rolling a die. So we had the sample space of these one, two, three, four, five, and six. Those were all possible outcomes. Then I defined an event A, which was rolling an odd number. So one, three, five. Those are the outcomes in A. And I defined B as rolling. Uh, a number oof, I forgot let's just define a new event B let's say rolling a number greater than three so four five six okay so just two arbitrary events okay now let's do some probability so what's the probability first off let's do the most basic case so What's the probability of, of just any particular outcome? So let's say, what's the probability of rolling a one? Well, remember, all possible outcomes are equally likely. So one over six, right? And likewise for rolling of any other number, one over six, okay? How about the probability of event A? So let's think of this. All the, well, the, the number of outcomes favorable to A are one, two, three. And the total number of outcomes in the sample space is six. So we get there's a 50% chance of rolling an odd number, which makes sense. Okay. How about the probability of event B? Well, there are, again, three possible outcomes 
favorable to B and six total outcomes possible so again there's a 50 percent chance of event B occurring okay let's combine some of this with what we learned in the previous tutorial namely um, complements intersections and so forth so let's see if we can come up with some more interesting questions here so uh, let's do the complement of A what's the complement of A these are all outcomes that are not in A so that would be 2 4 and 6 all right so that's if we need to write that down here so there's three outcomes favorable to a complement and six total outcomes so a comp probability of a complement is also one half the probability of not rolling an odd number is one half uh, probability of b complement will be rolling less than a four basically not b so all outcomes that are not in b so that's one two three that's three possibilities over six total so again one half what about the union of a and b so a union b so all outcomes that are either in a or in b or you could also think of that as are in at least a or b so let's think let me use a different color here let's underline all the outcomes that are in a or b so obviously one three five four five six but notice five was already here so we shouldn't double count it so as far as counting one three five four six I already counted five up here so I don't want to double count it so all events favorable to A or B well that's one two three four five there's five outcomes sorry favorable to A or B and six total possible outcomes in the sample space uh, the only outcome that is not in A or B is rolling a two right okay and how about let me write this in red how about the probability of A intersect B so this is all outcomes that are in A and B so let's be careful again and let's underline these so one is in A but it's not in B so I don't count that three is in A not in B don't count it five is in A and in B so I count that four is only in B five we already saw was in both six is only in, in um, B so it turns out they only have one event in common okay let me go back to red so there's only one outcome sorry I keep saying mixing event there's only one outcome namely rolling a five that A and B share so A intersect B is outcomes that are in both of the events A and B so there's only one outcome that's in both of those events over six okay so the probability that A and B happen is 1 over 6. The probability that A or B happens is 5 over 6. Okay. Now, let's ask one more question from this example. Are A and B disjoint? So let me see this. Let me put it in terms of a question. In other words, do they share any outcomes? The answer would be no if they shared any outcomes. And clearly we see that they shared the outcome 5. So A and B are not disjoint. Okay. Another way to see that is the intersection of A and B is not empty. 
it actually contains the event, the outcome of rolling a five. Okay, so A and B here, at least the way I've defined them in this example, it are not disjoint. Okay, and this brings us now naturally to some fundamental prob properties of probability, and we're going to close this um, section with the fundamental properties of probability. Okay. So one, some of these may seem obvious to you. For any event, E, the probability of E must be between zero and one. It cannot be less than zero or greater than one. The probability of zero means the event will never occur. Probability of one will me means that the event is certain to occur. Obviously, most of the time, the probability of an event is between these numbers, but 0 and 1 are also possible. 2 makes intuitive sense, right? The probability of the event, if we think of the sample space as the event which contains all outcomes, then the total number of outcomes of, of the sample space is equal to the number of outcomes of the sample space. So we would have uh, the same number in the numerator over the denominator. So we would end up with a probability of 1. If you go back to the formula, the identity we had prior when we introduced probability. So the probability that the sample space event will occur is 1. In other words, it's definite that one of the outcomes is going to happen. Okay, It's certain. 3. If E and F are disjoint, then the probability of E union F is simply the sum of the two probabilities. Okay, so this is if we know that E and F are disjoint. In other words, they don't share any outcomes. Okay, then the union of the two events is equal to the probability of the union of the two events is equal to the sum of the individual probabilities okay and let me actually make a note here for any event enf meaning if i know if i don't know if enf are disjoint the union is equal to the sum of the probabilities minus the intersection okay and let's let me illustrate this if e and f are disjoint that's the first case here that's the first case here then the probability of their union is simply summing the two regions okay But if I don't know if they're disjoint or not, I'm in a situation where I cannot assume. So I must account for the fact that they might possibly be joint like this. Okay. In this case, we know that the union is still this region. Except look what happens when we add the probability of E to the probability of f in this picture, we end up counting this middle region, that is the intersection, twice, right? We count it once when we take the probability of a, and then we count it a second time when we take the probability of b. So we're double counting the middle section here. And the middle section is the intersection. Okay, so we need to remove one of these intersections, and that's why if we don't know if the events are disjoint, we must 
subtract one of the intersections. Okay? It turns out that if the events are disjoint, this for this identity still holds because the intersection has a probability of zero because the intersection is empty, right? There is no intersection with, if the two events are disjoint, which is this case. So this would be like minusing zero. That's why here it's we leave it off, okay? All right, so I gave you two forms of this here. The special case when the two, you know the two events are disjoint and the more general case when you don't know whether they're disjoint or not. And so I added this as an extra here. This is useful, okay? So a little asterisk. And finally, number four, for any event E, the probability of E plus the probability of E complement must equal one, right? Think about this again with a picture. Here's E. E complement is everything not E. Together, notice they fill up the entire sample space. So their probabilities should add up to one. And they don't overlap, so there's no reason to worry about any kind of overlap like in the previous property, okay, when we're talking about complement events. Now this seems very obvious, but it's incredibly useful. So if you have the probability of E, uh, or if you need rather the probability of E and you have the probability of E complement, you can simply uh, move some of this stuff around and get the probability of E by su subtracting probability of E complement from one. This could save you tons of time when you get to um, more complex examples like the binomial distribution. As long as you're sure that these two events are complements of each other, then you can use this identity to save yourself lots of time and work in answering certain questions. So I hope this uh, third tutorial was helpful. Uh, on probability. Uh, we went through the fundamental properties of probability. We uh, did a little example. We actually started calculating some probabilities in a classical sense. Um, in the next video, I'm going to continue this and we'll continue to build on um, our understanding of probability. Till next time, thanks for watching. Make sure to share, comment, like, and have a great day.